for a panel discussion on the Indo-Pacific security calculus. Jagannath just told me that the topic is so vast, you can discuss anything under the sun and the moon. It's interesting how in the last few years, not just the term Indo-Pacific, but the whole security calculus of this area has suddenly become, people have woken up to it. Right now I'm researching some events of the 1990s, 98 specifically, and I've been reading up a lot on what was happening then. This is just before our nuclear test of 1998. In April and early May, Mr. George Fernandez, then Defense Minister, kept raising the point that China is potentially India's biggest threat. The word was potential. We obviously forgot, we just talked, why are making China a threat? And he said one, of course, was the border. Second was the heavy deployment of Chinese troops in Tibet, the activation of a number of airfields in Tibet, and the missile and nuclear cooperation between Pakistan and China. Uh, George Fernandez also mentioned once or twice that the way the PLA Navy is expanding, it should not be a surprise to us that after a few years we shall see the PLA Navy in the Indian Ocean. And that was considered to be very, all these statements of George Fernandez was considered very, very outlandish. She was attacked every side. Even people as restrained as late Shri Aike Gujral attacked him very strongly, etc. This was the time when Clinton was about to go to China for a visit. He wanted a success of the visit. And the Americans not only played down the Chinese-Pakistani cooperation in the nuclear and the missile field, and Pakistan had just tested Ghori, which is nothing but a variation of the Nodong one, North Vietnamese. But Ch Pakistan, Ch USA also lifted many curbs on dual-use technology to China. Because the understanding was that now that the Soviet Union is dead, which it was for some time to come, and now that China has emerged out of the post Tiananmen tensions, things are going to go better only. And as the Chinese grow, they'll become like one of us, us being the United States and the West. And therefore, we can start retrenching. We, the Americans and the Chinese, will talk to each other and we'll keep the world between us, calm and quiet. Between that and 20 years later, you can see how the entire scenario has changed, leaving Europe, Western Europe and that part out of it. In the Cold War, of course, the two main things for the USA was to keep the Eastern and Northeastern Asian region calm and quiet and Western Europe calm and quiet for which they deployed heavy troops in Western Europe, more than 100,000, and in, of course, Korea and Japan. Now that Russia is gone completely, Yeltsin's Russia had become very, very minor, and now that the Chinese and the Americans are on very good terms, they always been in very good terms after 71, but now that we have no issues, the enemy is forgotten, how things will become so peaceful and good? That they, I mean, the world of geopolitics will be completely dead. I think 20 years down the line, we all know how premature such deaths are, or as Mark Twain said, how exaggerated the reports of the death were. It was not at all exaggerated. Geopolitics may have seemed to have taken a pause. It didn't take a pause. It was merely that we decided to ignore what was happening and pretended all was well. I'm not for, by any means suggesting that we're in for any conflict, or especially armed conflict. It is just that the Challenges have emerged, new challenges have emerged, dormant ones have emerged, and, and what was earlier considered normal is no more considered normal. The fact that in 1991, we thought that the era of map, ma map making is over, clearly we were wrong. The era of map making is not over. And the use of force, even localized force, to quote unquote correct borders, is still something which is real today. We have before us a number of scholars and thinkers on the subject. Many of you have joined in, hope more will join in. And after I think our main speakers have spoken, we should have a very active, very heavy interactive 
So I would suggest to our speakers that keep yourself a bit limited. Just throw out the ideas that you find are really interesting. And then, because we are uh, not so good people around here, people thinkers around here, let's then debate it out and listen to each other. So let me now, with that, once again, let me welcome you. And let me call upon Dr. Jagannath Panda. Or Brendan will speak first. Okay. Let Brendan speak first. Okay. Uh, I get the honor of speaking first. This is, this is very nice. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, you, Director, um, for inviting me, uh, and, and, and Sanjay, you as well. This is a real honor and pleasure for me to be here at uh, the Nehru Muse Museum and Memorial Library. Um, uh, I don't know Indian history as well as I should, but I certainly know um, the words and the actions of uh, um, the late, great uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. And so it's, it's, a, it's just it, in, an added pleasure um, and honor to be here um, in, in a place that, that, that honors uh, him and documents his, his uh, incredible life. Um, I wonder what he would make of all of these developments that the director uh, just ran through, um, not just in the past 20 years, but in the past uh, 75 years or so. And that's what I'll start with, is I'll, I'll, I'll rewind just a bit and give a few brief comments setting the stage, and then I'll talk about some of my observations uh, and the insights I've received having been in New Delhi uh, for various conferences, um, including the 20th Annual Asian Security Conference at IDSA um, for the past week and a half. So during the five decades or so of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union, despite being ideological and geostrategic foes, attempted to define an international system that included structures and laws that formed the basis of today's post-World War II global governance. Now, I'm mentioning the USSR for a reason. Many would take umbrage with that, but I'll, I'll, I'll hope to dovetail on that point a little bit later on. Um, with the demise of the USSR, this bipolar world passed and an era of American unipolarity ensued um, that for some heralded a second, quote, American century, end quote. However, that area, era of U.S. hegemony with its emphasis on a liberal global order appears to have been relatively brief, and the longevity of both the Cold War structures of global governance and those of America's unipolar decade were increasingly questioned by the middle of the last decade. First and foremost among the voices calling for alternatives or an outright overthrow of the existing structures were the so-called emerging and rising powers, uh, amongst them Brazil, China, and Russia, as well as Mexico, South Africa, Turkey, Nigeria, Indonesia, and others, just to name a few. Questioning the status quo has continued apace, bolstered by the emergence over the past two decades of a gradual but robust shift in economic power and resources from west to east, with a much more modest shift towards the global south. What does all this mean to the post-World War II global governance system? This new multipolar world, for all its inconsistencies and unknowns, seems to be forming into distinct constellations of power. States that support the current global governance structure or states that wish to upend or at least refashion the post-war structure with its perceived or real inequalities and inequities that favor status quo over emerging powers. Please keep in mind my reference to constellations of power, by the way. Now, this is a neat typology, I'll admit, and it hardly addresses the complexity of what we are experiencing right now. For example, India is an emerging power. There's no doubt about that. And it's signaled it, its interest, admittedly, unevenly from time to time, in joining what we could term very much status quo power, such as Japan and the United States. And the emphasis there would be another state, which is the People's Republic of China. That, that would be the, the reason for this constellation of power, if that's what we're seeing. Um, but to give examples of other states, uh, why would Malaysia or the United Arab Emirates, where I'm based, uh, and a plethora of smaller but nonetheless rising powers, economically speaking, throw their lot in with a former and impossibly resurgent global hegemon like the United States. Alternatively, states such as Kenya and the Philippines seem to be able to hedge and play interested states against one another. Various international relations theories make answers to these simple conundrums appear easy, albeit contested depending on the school of thought. Yet the term Indo-Pacific as bandied about by states, persons, and stakeholders from U.S. President Donald Trump to Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi 
and the nascent strategy or strategies tethered to that term is becoming increasingly the currency whereby individuals and states understand and make choices about the merits of an unknown, unclear, but different global order embodied by China, and a global order led by the U.S., Japan, India, and other powers that is well-known but not particularly well-liked. The fact that the order is not principally well-liked does not mean that it has or will continue to be used and abused by what can be loosely termed rising in status quo powers. This is the case for countries such as Nigeria or Turkey, two rising powers that arguably chafe under the existing geopolitical and geoeconomic order, but nonetheless use it because a better alternative does not exist, at least not yet. The fact that references as well as some concrete moves have been made towards what appear to be the beginnings of a new or at least a post-U.S. global order, as embodied by a rise in China, has had the arguable effect of increasing the salience of the issue for states that fear or mistrust, or both, a China-dominated world. It is under this general threat, quote-unquote, that the position of state actors has arguably begun to visibly shift from uh, casual adherence to outright disinterest in upholding of the post-war global governance structure to one of increasing support. This shift is apparent in normative statements made by leaders about, quote, rule of law, or, quote, sea lane safety, and is led increasingly to a constellation of hard and soft power, and thereby the beginnings of a strategy that includes one great power in the form of the United States, one economic power in the form of Japan, one emerging power in the form of India, and one what we could term linchpin power in the form of Australia. These four states spread across the globe with very different sources of and outlooks on power now form the nucleus of what Prime Minister, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has nominated a, quote, free and open Indo-Pacific. Much of my ongoing research is in part stimulated by the ever-increasing use of this nomenclature by diplomats, policymakers, and leaders such as Prime Minister Modi, as well as scholars. Yet what the term actually means is unclear, and if the term is unclear, then the nascent strategies tacked onto that term are even more uncertain and therefore ripe for closer scrutiny. So let me end my prepared comments there and talk about some of my... Uh, some of my impressions and things I've learned over the past week and a half. Um, if we take the powers I mentioned, the quad, um, if you will, those uh, at, at, the, at the, the top of, of any Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, and I realize the quad and the Indo-Pacific are different, and that will come out, I'm sure, in the discussion. Um, if we take these as, as four ships of state, um, very large ships, uh, these super tankers we see now, there's something going on, um, and particularly over the past six months to a year, whereby you're beginning to see these ships that take a great deal of time and a great deal of distance to turn, right? You're beginning to see a shift in all four of these states. One commanded from New Delhi, one from Washington, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They might be turning in slightly different directions and at different speeds, but there is a turn going on. We're seeing that this constellation of power that I'm talking about is having an odd effect in international fora. It seems to be almost reinvigorating them at the very time populist sentiment and populist statements in places like Washington appear to be undermining them. Witness the recent moves of the United States at the UN, at the United Nations, vis-a-vis um, -vis Masood Azhar and to talk about Pakistan, etc. Um, the United States is a difficult and erstwhile ally at the best of times. It certainly has, uh, there's no love lost between it and the United Nations. There's a little town close to where I grew up which has declared a UN free zone because they're scared UN people in blue helmets are going to come in and take, take away their freedom. Um, but nonetheless, the forum is being used. All right, the outcome is uncertain, but the forum is being used to name and shame another power that in this case I believe it's quite clear why this is going on. Now, it's to score political points too, and they might be cheap political points, but I think it's not lost on anybody here in this room why these statements and why these resolutions should be passed. Okay. So I'm seeing a reinvigoration of, institutional, of, of international institutions and norms, and I'm also seeing, particularly in the Indian Ocean Basin, the importance of infrastructure, such as ports, 
and airports and railroads and the securitization of those. Now, that's a nice international relations political science term, meaning that if I say a port's important and it has a security role, then all of a sudden I've securitized it. All of a sudden that port is no longer just an entrepot of trade. It somehow has uh, some usage uh, um, for naval vessels, for example. Okay. Um, and so we're talking about balance of power. We're talking about uh, security calculi here. And I look a lot at Eastern Africa, um, the Horn of Africa in particular, uh, but also further south, Kenya, uh, Tanzania and Mozambique, Madagascar, etc. This is very much um, in India's near abroad. Okay? It's certainly not the United States near abroad, um, and certainly not Japan's either. Australia doesn't know quite what to do with the Indian Ocean yet. Um, but looking at developments in places like Mombasa, uh, in Berbera, in the, in the uh, self-declared independent but unrecognized Republic of Somaliland, Mogadishu, these involve powers, uh, Japan in Mombasa, but smaller powers such as Turkey in Mogadishu and the United Arab Emirates in Berbera. So very, very interesting partners, and if we're talking about an Indo-Pacific strategy of four, let's call them great powers uh, at this point, to separate them from rising powers such as Turkey, for example. And these could potentially make interesting um, allies or at least have common cause. Allies, a bit of a uh, common interest is what they would possibly have. Okay. We've seen this in a place like Djibouti, especially after DP World, the UAE company, was, was removed from port operations in February of 2018. And the Djiboutian government turned around and offered to hand that to a Chinese company. Now, there was an international outcry about this. But these are things that certain countries don't forget. They might have been forgotten here in New Delhi, but they certainly haven't been forgotten in Abu Dhabi. And they certainly haven't been forgotten in Washington, by the way. Okay. Um, there's a whole issue of the corresponding importance of things, uh, developments, uh, scientific and technological developments, AI, robotics, etc. The need to pool resources and, and, and the ability of four states to do so in a way that it's not possible for one state whether that's the United States or Australia or India, to do it alone. So there's, there's room to maneuver in this nascent strategy um, is what I'm seeing. Okay. Um, and then there's the, the – uh, this, this gets to this calculus of power issue, this four states um, with all the resources uh, and opportunities uh, that they can bring to bear should there be some sort of – Politico-military calculus. Now, if you remember at the beginning, I, I, I mentioned the Soviet Union and how it assisted uh, in some respects in constructing that post-war, post-World War II global order. Um, it was very much in opposition to that post-war global order in many respects, right? But nonetheless, that was the, the gelling, if you will. That was the rationale of, of the, the development of some of these by interested states, mostly in the West, um, but also in, 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 in the Western Pacific, okay? And then when it comes to power calculus, a, a, a comment came up yesterday, and it was actually mentioned by the director here very presently, about the Pakistani Navy, right, or, and, and the uh, People's Liberation Army Navy of, of the Chinese, the port of Gwadar being next door, um, and shifts in balances of power. What would it mean if a Chinese aircraft carrier was based in Gwadar, for example, Okay. Um, I'd encourage you to remember the issue of, of what, what has recently been termed in, in, in political science net power differentials. And this takes a very different look than, thing, than, than, than gross power, okay, GDP. And th th these are important indicators of power. But net power differentials separate this and look at things such as production costs in a country and internal security in a country. These are very, very telling. And the study that was done in particular looked at the difference between the People's Republic of China and the United States of America using these. And while these gross power measurements show China um, either gaining or far ahead of the United States in many of, the, many of these, the net power differentials show the exact opposite when these other issues are taken into account. All right? Lastly, I'll mention, because I am an international relations scholar, um, looking at the Indo-Pacific strategy from a realist perspective, if states only act on their own interests, then I believe, going back to the adage about the ships of state, that we're seeing a constellation of interests here. 
Okay? If we look at liberalism and the pooling of resources, again, it's driven by interests. But nonetheless, it has a lot to say about it, liberal institutionalism and the reinvigoration of, of either older institutions or perhaps the development of new. And then the lastly, there's constructivism. Okay? And we, I keep... The, the, the refrain keeps coming to issues of, of democracy, et cetera, et cetera. We saw what happened in elections, local elections in Turkey yesterday. A ruling party that had been in charge of, of Ankara and Istanbul was turfed out of power after 25 years, even though the president himself is viewed as an authoritarian leader. You understand this if you're, if you're from India in this room, okay? Um, reading in the newspaper today about the below-the-belt uh, charges um, that are being made, where Congress apparently gives biryani to terrorists, but Prime Minister Modi gives them uh, bullets and, and, and bombs. These are things I'm very familiar with coming from the United States. Okay? There's, there's, there's a... I, I don't want to overdo this, okay? and I don't want to other China in, in a self and other thing, but there is a constellation of common cause and interest, and I've seen this at international fora on the Indo-Pacific for the last at least two and a half, three years, where, in general, the Indians in the room, the Americans in the room, the Japanese in the room, and the Australians in the room are speaking a very common language, okay? And it's something you can't quite put your finger on, but it's there, all right? I'm sounding like a real optimist for the Indo-Pacific. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I will temper my comments, in the, in, but I'm being purposely provocative. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you, Ren, for that. Yes, the constellation is very important. But I've just got slightly diverted about the use of the word securitization. In the world of economics and finance, you securitize an asset. Basically, you're looking at the future flow of profit from it, and in advance, you're selling it off to people so that your debt is paid down even before the income stream starts. But obviously... It's not a parallel, but it does show into account how securitization has so much of uncertainty attached to it. Uh, Jagannath Randani. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me start uh, by thanking uh, director here, also Sanjay and uh, Tinmurti here. Um, I think uh, Brendan has tossed up on uh, uh, some of the key points. I'm not going to repeat all of those points. But towards the end, um, what he was actually referring to, uh, there is a way of uh, looking at it, uh, uh, realist perspective he was talking about, mm -hmm. then he tried to you know, frame it within an idealist perspective. Let me unpack the issue here, the Indo-Pacific issues. I mean, one way of looking at the Indo-Pacific region is um, to look at more from a const constructivist uh, perspective. And I think there are key ideas that we need to really figure it out, what we are really talking about in Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific um, strategic calculus is a, again, it's a broader theme, but within that uh, theme, if you try to identify country-specific interest and try to see it more from a const constructivist point of view, there are issues th that we could actually figure it out, uh, not only from Indian point of view, but from a holistic regional perspective. And there are Therefore, let me highlight on four eyes that the region Indo-Pacific today really invites. Um, and these four eyes I have written somewhere else and uh, in a, another paper which will be coming in the process, which needs to be really seen, not only from Indian point of view, but for a greater debate. One is, uh, the first eye probably is the ideas. Uh, ideas that are linked with the concept Indo-Pacific per se, and uh, uh, this idea which is not only defined the earlier ideas, but also encouraging new ideas to come. The second one is the interest. Interest of the individual countries which is there in the regions. So that's my second eye, how the country is actually trying to protect their interest. The third one is actually the institutions. New institutions which are really building up and trying to, if uh, not really replace, but in some ways putting a test taste to the older institutions which were there in the regions. The fifth is, which is the practical need of the countries or the regions, that is the infrastructure. So it's the four pack of package of eyes, ideas, interest, institutions, and infrastructure, which is actually shaping the discourse of Indo-Pacific today. Let me uh, talk about that first eye, ideas. 
I mean, there are two ways of uh, looking at it. One is, of course, uh, one might claim that uh, Indo-Pacific is an entirely new idea which is there for the last four or five years. Some historians will claim that this idea always existed 50, 70 years back. So there is this debate going on. But one thing I think um, we must have figured it out uh, while talking about Indo-Pacific is that it's not so much about uh, the class of ideas of this concept. It's actually um, the ideas linked with the civilizational discourse that the countries are actually fighting for. And uh, therefore, I would uh, completely agree with the uh, director's point earlier when he referred about China. This uh, concept needs to be understood from the Chinese point of view. Uh, I think uh, that is the most important point why the idea of Indo-Pacific today have arrived and it didn't really arrive earlier. And even though it arrived earlier, why it didn't really come into the prominence? Primarily because of the rise of China, and that cannot be ruled out. Now, when we are talking about this Indo-Pacific uh, idea today, uh, there are key points needs to be remembered, that the old ha ideas have not really been discarded and they have not really been put into the, into the dustbin. In fact, the old ideas are also equally making pressing statements. For example, if the liberal, if there is a virtual liberal world nexus, its understanding has emerged with, uh, with, the, uh, with the framework of Indo-Pacific, that is primarily India, US, Japan, Australia led with the other liberal-minded countries, then the Chinese are really challenging it by reiterating the term Asia-Pacific. And we saw that two years back, three years back, they released the white paper on Asia-Pacific. And the Chinese statement is becoming more and more assertive that they do not want to uh, give up this term Asia-Pacific. And that, that actually serves the Chinese purpose. And today, if you try to see, that has actually created a contradiction among the liberal world countries. Australia has not completely given up the Asia-Pacific framework. In fact, Australia's national interest foreign policy is very much relied on the Asia-Pacific framework, even though there is an increasing reference about Indo-Pacific in its foreign policy. And one more point about this class, class of ideas is that what needs to be understood from the Chinese point of view is that there is a historical angle attached to the, to the um, class of ideas, which is partly civilizational. If we try to understand from the Chinese, and probably partly we have not really nurtured that thing in Indian foreign policy, and I think with the current government and uh, with the Prime Minister Modi, the things have been more clearly articulated in Indian foreign policy. Uh, and uh, somehow we have overlooked it for the last 30, 40, 50 years in our foreign policy. But the Chinese have been um, a master country in some ways. They have not really discarded the history. In fact, any capital making in the Chinese foreign policy has always been linked with their traditional or historical foreign policy. And therefore, if you try to say uh, what they are talking about Asia-Pacific and reiterating on Asia-Pacific, they are building on the regions. They are building on the regions, even though they are talking about Asia-Pacific, one of the concepts they are trying to gradually you know, build, uh, which is actually increasing ch increasingly challenging Indo-Pacific, even though it's not going to replace, or I don't really see it's a differently, uh, it's, it's a differently outlet concept altogether. But again, the Chinese are actually increasingly talking about a Eurasia framework, and this is what we saw in last 10 to 12 years. They established uh, Shanghai uh, 5, they promoted it to Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Now they have built it as a Eurasian organization, clubbing India and Pakistan together. So they are open to new ideas, new you know, additional uh, arguments. Of course, I am not here saying that Eurasia as a framework is completely different from Indo-Pacific or Eurasia is going to replace it. But this is the capital building of ideas. The second one is the interest, the class of interest which is there in the Indo-Pacific regions, and that needs to be understood from India's point of view more, because uh, we are an emerging economy, whereas if we try to compare it with China, they have successfully, or some would say, they have already emerged to some extent as a developed economy. Uh, of course, there are critical elements in the Chinese economy. There are debates that the Chinese economy is struggling. There are gray areas. All of those debates, if we keep aside, um, it makes sense to see how the interests, there is a class of interest in Indo-Pacific regions. And therefore, there are two specific class of interest is visible. One is a, a class of interest on resources, that is energy to, you know, securing uh, different kind of uh, uh, geopolitical components in the regions. The second class of interest is happening about identity, holding identity. 
Uh, this identity, of course, the identity debate is, is, a, is a much bigger and larger debate, but when you try to understand it in the Indo-Pacific regions, uh, resource competition is well known to everyone because each of the emerging countries and each of the countries, they are trying to you know, secure more and more energy resources, be it oil, gas, or uh, other components. But the identity politics, which is somewhat why we are unable to, you know, um, understand, or maybe we are partly overlooked in the process, is that in each of the sub-regions of Indo-Pacific, um, there is a class of identities going on, uh, going on, is that who is going to really be the prominent power there? Uh, the Chinese are gradually building that, and that is really rele relevant from India's point of view. If you try to understand the point I earlier made, is that successfully they have turned Shanghai Cooperation Organization as an UIC organization. If you try to understand from South Asian point of view, and again, I think uh, uh, Ambassador Bhattacharya would uh, understand this point, is that uh, um, the Chinese foreign policy has always been primarily focused on um, Central Asia, and Northeast Asia traditionally. Uh, in last two decades or so, there is an increasing focus on Southeast Asia because Southeast Asia is key to their interest. Of course, on South Asia today. But on Southeast Asia, they have tried to divide the ASEAN framework. They have tried to create ruffles within the countries. They have been assertive on South China Sea. At the same time, they have tried to bring out economic formulations where they can talk about unity with the Chinese leadership. So each of the sub sub-units or sub-regions of Indo-Pacific regions have been taken seriously in, by the Chinese. That has not really been taken seriously by the liberal world countries or the so-called India or US or Japan in that context or by Australia. That is one critical point that needs to be understood, including in West Asia where Chinese are really a prominent player. The third point is about the institutions. And I think this is a key point in the, in the framework of Indo-Pacific, and uh, we tend to be overlooking that point, is that if we try to understand the arrival of Indo-Pacific debate, um, there is a, a range of older institutions, or what we called earlier Bretton Woods institutions. And uh, these Bretton Woods institutions are still there. The Chinese are trying to you know, improve their positions, and in fact, if you see, um, India actually agreed with China at some point in 2006, 7, 8. Um, and in fact, uh, in 2000, when, uh, and I think uh, director will uh, share with us more, when he was with uh, the former late Prime Minister Bajpayee, uh, Bajpayee going to China in 2000, that, was a, that brought a significant change to India's outlook towards China. And that was the period when India actually, in fact, Prime Minister Bajpayee acknowledged publicly in China China as an emerging economic power. And from there onwards, for next one and a half decade, we try to associate with China as a revisionist power. Uh, because we, we ourselves are trying to become a revisionist power. We are an emerging economy. We had different sticks in the world uh, framework. We try to reform the uh, Bretton Woods institutions. We try to demand a greater voice there. We try to demand that IMF, World Bank, and uh, WTO must be reformed in the interest of the developing countries. We, we expressed our reservation in the voting patterns. In fact, 2007 onwards, 8 onwards, the voting patterns of India, China, and emerging countries have actually gone up in, in all of this Britain. But the point I would make here is that that is the period in 2007 and 8 when BRICS actually arrived. And BRICS made a statement in the sense that here is an emerging uh, economies club which actually going to uh, reform the global order in, to to, to some extent. So that means what we are today talking about, we have not really discarded those Bretton Woods institutions. We are very, they are very much there. But a new set of institutions which have come up, and India is also equally a part of that, and there I think the interest not, to be, not only to be protected, but also to be enhanced. AIIB, New Development Bank, these are the new institutions which have come, and I think India needs to take uh, interest there and nurture all, all of these institutions. The fourth I is the politics of infrastructure, and I think that's the key, uh, because um, uh, it's, 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 it's a practical interest. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, linked with each and every country's economy here. Uh, and I think if we try to understand the infrastructure, why it has become the most important uh, issue in Indo-Pacific region today, is because so most of the economies are heavily dependent on the infrastructural development today. And I think Prime Minister Modi is continuously making the statement since he has arrived in the power. 
Uh, but I think there are three broader points uh, here needs to be noted. One is that there is a response and real response has happened to the infrastructure politics. One, of course, the Chinese have tried to come out with their flagship event uh, project, that is the BRI Itha Ilu. But before that, the Chinese, uh, the, the Japanese actually introduced uh, the strategy of a PQI, Partnership of Quality Infrastructure. Uh, and to some extent, the Chinese actually responded to the PQI initiatives. But again, the Japanese again re-responded by expanding the framework of PQI to EPQI, Expanded Partnership of Quality Infrastructure, which is actually looking much beyond the Indo-Pacific regions. As a result, today we are talking about Asia Africa Growth Corridor. Uh, so that's, that is one new element in the Indo-Pacific regions. From India's point of view, of course, we are not really a significant economy in, in terms of the way the Chinese infrastructural initiatives really um, um, comes to the regions, the way the Japanese operate their foreign policy. But I think from India's point of view, we might really look like a reluctant infrastructure investment uh, country. But again, there has been a forwarding initiatives has been taken up and uh, that needs to be commended. We, today, we are having neighborhood first policy where infrastructure is connecting with the neighboring countries is one of the most important issue. Arctist policy, which is the reformulation of the locust policy. We have a link west policy, which, is, which, has, which was from the previous government connect Central Asia policy. So all of these things, if we try to put it, we are the central actor in the Indo-Pacific when it comes to the infrastructure politics today. So it's, and there is a statement from India's point of view, why we have taken a strong position on the Belt and Road Initiative and why we have not really. So I'll just stop with these thoughts and then maybe we can discuss later on. Thank you. Thank you, Jagannath, for that. Lots to say, but I will just raise one. I'm not too sure that really so we were asking and we negotiated an increase in the voting shares of the IMF and China, of course, got a much greater share, is that we could be seen in the same land as being a revisionist power. We are more in the nature of a status quo power which likes incremental changes through negotiations rather than unilateral action like the building of islands in the South China Sea or the incorporation of Crimea as an example. You know? So in that sense, of course, there are lots and lots of other things to say. Uh, share Pandey, you will be speaking to us on the role of Europe in it, right? Yes. The role of Europe in the Indo-Pacific. Good morning, everybody. I shall be talking about the European presence in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the EU Global Strategy 2016 at the outset states that we need a stronger Europe, our union is under threat, and our European project is constantly being questioned. But then again, they say that uh, the EU is grounded in values and enshrined in the treaties and building on our strengths and historic achievement, which seems to suggest that there is no dynamism in their approach. Uh, Federica Mogherini, who is the high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, stated that the purpose, even existence of a union is being questioned, more so after the British referendum. And she says that we have to rethink the way our union works which seems to indicate a shift of strategy. But then she goes on to add that we perfectly know what to work for, we know what our principles, our interests and priorities are. Again, it shows that they are not really ready to bring about any change or innovation in their uh, approach. The principles uh, guiding EU external action are, of course, uh, principled pragmatism, which, of course, reflects a guarded response. As far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned, they actually refer to this area when they talk about a connected Asia, where they are talking about ratcheting up the economic diplomacy, and they do not talk specifically about any military involvement whatsoever. They also talk about a politically rounded approach to Asia, and the only place where they mention Indo-Pacific is in the context of promotion of human rights and supporting democratic transitions, specifically in Myanmar. Um, uh, Frederica Mogherini also does not inspire a lot of confidence when she says that the report of the EUGS that she is going to submit to the European Council will not be their first priority. She also says that we put a lot of emphasis on things that are not really welcome, such as human rights and values. Um, but this makes them quite predictable. This certainly cannot be considered to be a very positive connotation. They also claim to be uh, a point of reference in the world. 
Yes, maybe in rule making, but certainly not in getting things done. So the global strategy of the European Union seems to pursue strategic interest in a cooperative world order, which is actually an ideal type. Uh, when EU talks about its Asia strategy, it is uh, about uh, connecting transport, energy and digital networks and they go on to talk about cooperation in culture, sport and tourism, diversity and free flow of ideas in the same breath. So there seems to be no focused strategic thinking. <clears throat> When they talk about connectivity and security, it is actually about safety of these networks rather than any in-depth strategic discussion about the likely impact of European presence in the area. The EU's China strategy talks mainly about strengthening dialogue and communication and cooperation at the national, regional and international levels. However, there is a breath of fresh air when we talk about EU strategy on India, where EU is seen talking about security dimensions. It contends that India is a heavyweight uh, on the Asian continent and a strong partnership with India would lead to a balanced EU policy towards Asia as a whole. They also say that India is situated at the center of key Europe-Asia routes. They also say that a multipolar Asia is necessary and that can, open, uh, that can happen only when there is an assertive uh, India in a multipolar world. Um, uh, when we talk about BRI, uh, there is a lot of Western skepticism about the BRI, uh, but the Europeans uh, do not uh, actually understand that the only free cheese is in the mousetrap, as can be seen by the endorsement of the AIIB by France, Germany and UK, and not less than 11 Central and Eastern European countries signing MOUs with China within the framework of BRI. Um, and the Chinese presence is to be seen everywhere. I will not go into the details of uh, uh, where all they are, but be it railway hubs, be it land sea express, uh, be it a very long line uh, from Wuhan in China to France, uh, which is 11,000 square kilometers long. Kilometers. Uh, kilometers, sorry. 11,000, yes, sir. sir. 11,000 kilometers uh, uh, long, um, so they are everywhere. The port of Perio in Greece uh, it deserves special mention because it is the fastest growing container port worldwide. Um, so BRI has obviously diluted uh, European political unity and this has been accentuated by the 16 plus 1 format where the CEE countries meet uh, annually with uh, the, prem the Chinese Premier and some money is doled out. Um, there are permanent secretariats on uh, maritime affairs, on technology transfers in Europe set up by China, largely funded by China's Exim Bank. And um, Germany and France have also endorsed EU-China connectivity, but they have of course expressed concerns regarding the maintenance of international standards, rules and IPR. So there has to be of course recognition of the fact that there is going to be a major reorganization of the global value chain along the trade routes between China and Europe. The latest uh, country to put its uh, 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 symbol of approval on BRI is of course Italy. It is the first G7 country to do so and it is one of the leading manufacturing uh, exporters of Europe and it uh, intends to gain from it. But many, many states are uh, uh, skeptical about it and they say that Italy has taken a big political risk for little economic uh, gain. And uh, because Europe's largest exporters to China, Germany and France have still not signed on similar accords. Now we come to France and Indo-Pacific. As we know, France is rooted in the southern part of the Indian Ocean as well as uh, it is anchored very much in the Pacific Ocean. It has uh, stationed overseas and permanent military uh, overseas troops there, 6,300 uh, military personnel in all, and permanent military bases allow France to fulfill the security responsibilities of a resident power of Indo-Pacific. France and Japan have a very strong alliance. Of course, uh, France wants to normalize, sorry, Japan wants to normalize its defense posture and France wants to increase its presence in the Indo-Pacific. Their cooperation mainly focuses on maritime security in South Pacific. Various interesting quadrilateral training in amphibious operations have also happened here. For instance, the Japanese, French, US and British ships got together uh, for this Jordi Arc mission in, near Guam. And, um, 
France basically wants entry into the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus uh, and uh, Multilateral Security Cooperation. France has also gone ahead to sign not less than six strategic partnerships with countries in this region. Uh, Macron had come in May 2018 and he talked about a Paris-Delhi-Canberra uh, axis. And um, um, uh, of course we know about the famous infamous Rafael deal that was signed between uh, India and France. And uh, uh, we also uh, see uh, that uh, France is uh, very much concerned about Indian Ocean region and uh, uh, Charles de Gaulle, the aircraft carrier, is supposed to come and hold uh, the annual Varuna exercises in India. It is also being advocated that EU should expand and intensify its relations in the security domain with Japan, especially because of the European Partnership Agreement that covers 40% of global uh, trade has come by. But of course it did not garner a lot of media attention which shows that China is of course much more influential than Japan. Um, ja Japan's grand strategy is to bring Europe geographically closer. While the Pacific Ocean obviously does not ring a bell to many Europeans, the Indian Ocean should, as it is Europe's broader neighborhood, linked to the EU via the Persian Gulf. And um, now we come to UK and Indo-Pacific. Uh, Theresa May and her uh, Defense Secretary have been talking about a global Britain, especially in the post-Brexit scenario, and they have started reinvesting in relations in South and Southeast Asia. Therefore, they made it a diplomatic priority to get Prime Minister Narendra Modi to attend uh, the Commonwealth Summit and he was accorded a red carpet treatment which indicates a reset in ties and Britain has also uh, delinked de its uh, uh, ASEAN policy from, its, uh, from the European Union as it welcomed the ASEAN Secretary General Dato Lim Jok Hoi to London. Um, there has been a significant presence of the UK Navy vessels in this area. Um, they are also opening a military base in Far East. Brunei and Singapore seem to be the likely uh, choice. UK currently maintains a small logistics facility at Sembabang Naval, Naval Base. And um, there is this uh, interesting five-part defense arrangement 1971 uh, between UK, Malaysia, Singapore, Australia and New Zealand according to which uh, they actually fulfill a number of security commitments in this region. Um, uh, of course, uh, Britain needs to uh, revamp its role in Indo-Pacific, uh, keeping in mind the economic and commercial growth that can happen in this region, as well as the UK arms sales, uh, because the largest recipient of UK arms is Saudi Arabia, Oman, and then Indonesia. Uh, in, uh, India and UK have also been talking about partnership in Indo-Pacific on areas like blue economy, connectivity, and technology. Uh, UK can always play a role um, in the Asia-Africa uh, grow, growth uh, corridor and they can always co obviously confabulate on issues uh, under the uh, ages of the Commonwealth on issues such as sustainable development, cybercrime and connectivity. UK also has a battalion of Gurkha infantry based in Brunei. It is reportedly opening new high commissions in Vanuatu, Tonga and Samoa and it has signed defence packs with Singapore and Australia. And uh, we were mentioning the five uh, uh, th three eyes or four eyes. Uh, they, uh, UK also has this five eyes groups group basically uh, concentrating on intelligence cooperation. Uh, UK and Japan are also coming very close together. In January 2019, Shinzo Abe actually paid a visit to Theresa May. She was very busy, obviously, but she took time out to uh, treat him well. And this is for obvious reasons, because UK has naval strength, which is larger than France, Italy, and Germany combined. And of course, they have historical and institutional linkages. Um, when we come to Germany, the Federal Foreign Office um, website and uh, what they say about this area uh, shows that Germany is confounded by the area. It seems to say at the very outset that even subdivisions into geographic areas uh, barely makes the job any easier to understand. There are stark contrasts. The concepts which have been drawn up over the years, given the region's heterogeneity, only had a moderate impact in practice. But 
they are also quite candid enough to accept that German interest is still focused primarily on the economic side of German-Asian relationship. The German Foreign Minister uh, Heiko Maas has in fact uh, articulated the German approach in a very uh, uh, clear manner when he says that Germany should actually lead an alliance of multilateralists which should include regional powers, middle powers and states below the uh, great powers so that uh, a rule based on order can be ensured and they uh, think that the recourse to international organizations and their operability should be taken and uh, Germany of course can lead such a coalition in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, of course there will be challenges because uh, the, Asia, the, the countries present there would not like to take sides and anger China and secondly it would also challenge the centrality of ASEAN in Indo-Pacific affairs. The U.S. also wants to utilize the presence, the British and the French presence in Indo-Pacific uh, in order to ensure regional balance through their strategic relations, arms sales, and military-to-military -military relationships. Um, however, Trump administration's FOIP strategy has not been endorsed by UK or France yet. Trump administration's national defense strategy emphasizes the need to strengthen alliances and attract new partners. And it also emphasizes that Europeans, the NATO allies, UK, Canada, France, all have enduring interests in the Indo-Pacific. Now I come to the conclusion, um, everybody wants to become a great power, every state, be it uh, the EU, China, Russia, America, Britain, France and Japan. We find a distinct echo of the hegemonic stability theory, uh, but it is not only America which is uh, concerned about the stakes and of maintaining the order, it is the other powers, the regional and middle powers, uh, who are also, who also uh, want to be extremely involved in bringing about a rule-based order in this part of the world, the Indo-Pacific will continue to garner a lot of attention till the politically charged seismic plates settle down. The reverberations of the Indo-Pacific will continue to impact upon actors throughout the world. The sole espousing of normative principles by the EU will not suffice. Strategic clarity should be given an impetus. At the most, the EU and its member states do show the readiness to aggressively engage but not assertively intervene in Indo-Pacific. The key question to be asked thus is, is Europe ready to take the plunge? The answer probably is no, not yet. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. That is because Europe doesn't know what Europe is, you know. The trouble with uh, any regional grouping, and both of you mentioned, Jagannath, you mentioned, mentioned it, we thought by regional groupings will lessen national sovereignty, tensions over national sovereignty basically. Trouble with regional groupings is, as Russia did it very effectively with EU, because it's consensus based, you have to get one country to speak up for you. So if Hungary speaks up for you, Cyprus speaks up for you, Romania speaks up for you, that is the end of European consensus. And if one Laopedia or one Cambodia speaks up, is the end of ASEAN consensus. So regional groupings definitely have limitations in, in the real world of geopolitics, much as they are very relevant on the point of view of economic development, trade, etc. Dipanjan, over to you for the last formal speech yeah. before we open it up. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> first, let me clarify, I'm not an academic like the rest of the people who have gathered here. I'm a journalist who write on foreign policy for Economic Times, and Indo-Pacific is one of the areas which has attracted my attention in the last uh, couple of years. And uh, thanks to Sanjay and uh, Mr. Sina that, I'm, that the, they gave me the opportunity to uh, speak from my understanding of this concept. Uh, I was in uh, Jakarta last to last week uh, to uh, attend uh, indo attend in the sense to cover a Indo-Pacific high-level dialogue, which was the first of its kind by uh, in the region uh, comprising the EA states. They had uh, invited all the 18 EA states, which is the 10 ASEAN, plus uh, US, Russia, China, India, uh, Australia, South Korea, Japan, and New Zealand. New Zealand was the last entrant. Uh, most of the countries were represented at the uh, senior vice minister level. Uh, India was represented by Secretary West in the Ministry of External Affairs. And uh, Australia, of course, as the closest neighbor of Indonesia, was represented by the foreign minister, and so was Brunei. Uh, 
Um, uh, Indonesia, uh, in New Zealand could not send its foreign minister because of the crisis after the attack on the two mosques. Uh, one idea which, uh, which uh, and I'm, I'm going to constantly refer to that, uh, to that, to that conference uh, and, and my uh, deliberations with the uh, senior Indonesian officials who are in the task of uh, creating an Indo-Pacific concept for Indonesia and how they can bring all the concepts into, uh, synergize into one. So Indonesia has felt uh, in the last two years and the, under the uh, current uh, foreign minister and led by um, and as directed by Jokowi is is that there are, that it's a fulcrum country in the in the region between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific and they need to take a lead uh, in in the in the development of the Indo-Pacific concept when when number of uh, concepts exists they are trying to amalgamate uh, that into if at all, uh, synergize into, into, into a larger uh, macro picture where it builds into trust. You know, the entire exercise as, uh, as, as being envisaged by Indonesia is, is trust building among the states. And with, in the existence of number of uh, Indo-Pacific concepts besides South Korea's uh, Look South policy, China's Belt and Road Initiative, and somewhere, you know, Indonesians uh, like India has believed in non-alignment or still believes in non-alignment more than India does, I, I realize, and, and are very wary of publicly or even privately, you know, uh, taking sides. Uh, and, and in a way, you know, have been wary of uh, President Obama's neglect of the region uh, for, ten, uh, for eight years. And while President Trump has been, you know, of the, you know, have, have focused on the region, there's a sense that, uh, you know, the, the focus is primarily on the Pacific and not so much on Indian Ocean. And this is, I'm talking about, uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, Indonesian. And this is also, uh, in my opinion, somewhere a, a position which the Thai uh, senior, uh, Vice Foreign Minister also reflected, which was, which was coincided with the, with the Indonesian concept. And, uh, you know, uh, they would say that, you know, it was Indonesia who take, took the lead on in, inclusive Indo-Pacific. And my argument was that, you know, the Prime Minister Modi was the first one who, who spoke about uh, inclusive Indo-Pacific and, and, you know, the Indonesia followed suit in, in that. Because he's, he spoke uh, on the inclusive and open Indo-Pacific after his visit to Indonesia. Uh, and from the Shangri-La dialogue, and Indonesia didn't talk about an in inclusive Indo-Pacific at that point of time while he was visiting uh, Jakarta last May. And it was only, you know, after the Prime Minister Modi said that India's Indo-Pacific is not directed against any particular country, and it's it's uh, it's inclusive, it's open, and and uh, you know there are certain real uh, geopolitics which were where uh, which which India and uh, which we cannot overlook and probably Indonesia also cannot overlook is is the presence of China as the as neighbor of India with with a 4,000 kilometer unresolved boundary and we saw what what happened in 2017. Uh, in, in the form of the Roklam, whether it was a reaction to a closer, uh, you know, Indo, US, Japan, Australia partnership, emerging uh, partnership, or whether the Chinese thought that, you know, this, if, if, if they press ahead with Roklam further, that can bring India closer to the US. But these are certain geopolitical realities which, which can't be ignored by a country like India. And for many countries in Southeast Asia, China is the largest trading partner. China is, in fact, largest trading partner for most of the countries in the world today, be it Argentina or be it, be it, be it Mongolia. So, and, and, the, and the Chinese population in, 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 in the in Southeast Asian countries, the way those population have been manipulated in the last couple of years, including in Singapore, and there is a new migrant of... of, of of, of the mainland Chinese coming into Singapore in the last couple of years, second generation who, who, uh, who, does, who some, sometimes can't even speak English, you know, and, and they like to speak in Mandarin or, or Cantonese or whatever language they bring in. So there are these realities with, which some of the Southeast Asian nations cannot ignore as they, uh, you know, uh, look for their place in the Indo-Pacific and, and try to, therefore, you know, bring the factor of the ASEAN centrality, which Prime Minister Modi also spoke in his speech and which we have been harping on that. And it's only that after India spoke of the ASEAN centrality uh, that 
that the, the, the Quad and the other countries in the last meeting uh, is, has brought ASEAN centrality into, into their uh, concept, you know, the Japan, US. Japan is, of course, more willing because their, their, uh, their um, uh, involvement with, in, with the Southeast Asian nations. Uh, my uh, increasingly, uh, my, my prognosis increasingly that somewhere there is a larger sensitivity now with a, with a open U.S. role in Southeast Asia and how the Quad is going to play into it. You know, any, you know, U.S. role in West Asia was considered more sensitive on the streets of West Asia, right? In Southeast Asia, for decades, you know, be it Thailand, be it Philippines, be it Singapore, and even under Suharto in Indonesia, uh, was, the, the, you know, the U.S. was there, was, there was no street movements in, in, in these countries against U.S. But there's an increasingly, um, you know, this, this is very subtle. There, there, is, there is this uh, U.S. wariness about U.S., you know, and how much we should publicly go with U.S. And whether we go with U.S. and the U.S., uh, you know, freedom of uh, navigation operations in South China Sea, how will the China react to it? Wary of China, as uh, Mr. Sina mentioned, you know, you been divided, the ASEAN has been divided through Cambodia. What role will Thailand play in, in the current ASEAN chair as, uh, you know, as, 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 ASEAN, as Thailand talks about multipolarity? They want to bring uh, other countries also there. Uh, I, I see some signs of Russia getting interested in, in, in that region, very nascent, where you know, they don't have the wherewithal to, with, to follow through. But you know, wh where will all these countries, you know, sort of go into, uh, you know, develop a larger Indo-Pacific concept and, uh, and how much will it, will groupings, you know, each grouping, uh, you know, like Quad or India, Indonesia, Australia or India, Japan, Australia uh, groupings, how would, how would these uh, amalgate into, into one macro sort of loose structure or everything, you know, sort of getting, you know, a trust building exercise should be formed through an ADMM, you know. There are already talks about France kind of being accommodated into ADMM. To be, my, my own uh, analysis should be that we should have, you know, we should go through the existing structures uh, for this part of Indo-Pacific region, particularly through the ADMM, and build a trust, uh, uh, have a trust building because there are certain geopolitical realities which cannot be, if, if U.S. has been a partner in, in, for some of these countries, in Thailand, in Philippines, there is this Chinese shadow and the, and, and the Chinese money which is hanging over, you know, and, and the role of the Chinese diaspora, which is in, Indonesia is probably one country which will probably, in my opinion, will be the last frontier where, where the Chinese will face a sort of a backlash because, you know, for decades they have developed their own identity by keeping, you know, the, the, by, by, by rather asking the Chinese population to, to keep quiet and having, having an Indonesian identity. But rest of the countries are willing to, you know, uh, you know deal with the Chinese and, and they have certain sensitivity. Uh, even Vietnamese have certain sensitivity, but, you know, China is the biggest investor in Vietnam, you know. How do the Vietnamese deal with the Chinese when it comes to a crisis? Will it be, will they react like 1979 or will it, will it, my sense, they will probably react, you know, they will, all, all, all they will, they will, they will narrow down all their uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, I, I would say, not the difference, but, but, you know, but, but overcome their Chinese uh, sort of love for China and, and sort of come together to, you know, fight. But these, you know, therefore it's, it's a very fluid kind of situation and Indo-Pacific is a work in progress. Uh, it's, it's a work in progress by India, it's a work in progress by US, uh, by Japan, by, by Australia. And, and while for India, it's, it's, it's you know, there, there's, there's an Eastern Africa and, and then West Asian part to the Indo-Pacific. For, for many countries, like for Japan and for, for Australia, it would primarily be the ASEAN and the East Asian theater that will be important. And how, you know, it's still a work in progress to an a final word, in my opinion, has not been said. And, and certain exercises like this, what, what Indonesia undertook or what uh, uh, Quad is, is doing in a very subtle way is probably to try and build trust uh, and, and see that these concepts amalgate into a wider uh, ADMM, in my opinion, for a trust building to, to basically maintain the stability and the, and the rules-based order. That's what most of these countries are trying to do. Yeah. Thank you, Dibanya. Thank you. Now open it up to... General comments, specific questions. Pinak? The usual. Yeah. 
Well, thank. Uh, I would like to first thank all the presenters for their very varied comments that uh, one has heard. Clearly, Indo-Pacific is the whole concept is still work in progress, uh, even in the concept terms. I think. Uh, forget about oper operationalizing various things, and um, perhaps Brendan can throw more light on. The fact that even India and America don't agree where Indo-Pacific actually begins, at least begins on, in, in India's neighborhood. Uh, the U.S. wants to protect uh, the Gulf and the Arabian Sea uh, uh, for its own reasons, uh, of a CENTCOM based in Bahrain and stuff like that. And it doesn't want this overlap with India. But clearly India's interests begin from the... Uh, from the Arabian Sea and the east coast of Africa. So, you know, there are these conceptual uh, sort of uh, conflicts still there, apart from the many other sort of uh, unresolved conflicts that are there. So I think I'd like to highlight this uh, because uh, you need, need certain overlapping, you know, uh, philosophical also, you know, congruency uh, when you think of these things. Uh, then, of course, is the whole business of how, um, how almost all countries are today hedging in terms of their foreign policy. Everybody seems to be hedging, uh, you know, do, dealing with everybody. So is India, by the way. I mean, I don't exclude India. You know, be part of everything and, you know, uh, don't sort of put your eggs in one basket. That's the kind of approach we are seeing today. And it's, um, uh, and I think there is some rational basis for it. And uh, without, uh, I mean, one can be critical of that or one can, you know, debate it. But I think there is a rational basis for it because, because clearly the central issue is the rise of China and, and the economic issue. I think India is focused on its economy. We don't want too much of, uh, you know, turbulence in, around us in that sense. And so it's, it's a very slow process of, I suppose, attrition that we will start working on all these issues. And we are not going to give up the options that we have uh, with the others. So, so that's the kind of situation we have. Where it will all go is, of course, um, anyone's guess. I mean, we can all write um, papers and scholarly tomes on all these things, but uh, I don't see it happening very quickly. And uh, I would also sort of put a caveat that, uh, uh, that there's no need to rush into anything. Uh, I mean, I think that's the kind of approach uh, many countries still have. Thank you. So I don't have any experience in IR, so probably that's my justification for asking a very dumb question. Okay, I'm uh, Kavita Soraide. I'm a fellow at NMML. So I was just wondering, when we hear this, uh, these presentations, there appears to be uh, some sort of an overt diplomacy in Indo-Pacific, and at the same time there is some, something what can be probably called a stealth diplomacy going on for every nation, uh, which, wa which wants to keep its uh, traditional conventional ties as well. So uh, in that I was thinking like um, it seems that Indo-Pacific is more to counter the, the fear and the mistrust for China and if there is any scope in this work in progress to find uh, or to fine tune or to cover those civilizational gaps which the conventional diplomacy does in case of China let's when we talk about ASEAN or so I was just wondering like is this merely to counter China the fear of China the Psychosis. Thank you. Uh, question is to Jagannath. <clears throat> I know you're being a little provocative deliberately when you say that Indo-Pacific is only a consequence of rise of China. My question is, can there be Indo-Pacific if India did not rise? Question, does all the presentations 
individually and cumulatively, are we to take it that the end of bipolar world, two superpowers, is well and truly over, and we are moving towards a new concert, not of Europe, but of the world powers itself? Thank you. Okay. Uh, the ambassador's comments were, were well taken. Um, I think you, you understand that uh, the, yeah, the Indian Ocean portion of the Indo-Pacific is, is contested and everybody uh, the, in the Quad, um, this, this nascent partnership, Indo-Pacific partnership, have different views geographically of what this means. Um, my sense uh, is that in Washington, this is more of a bureaucratic wrangle than anything else. The U.S. has deep-seated interests in both the Western and the Eastern Indian Oceans, as well as in the entire Pacific. Um, and while they are not defined by what we're seeing as an Indo-Pacific um, as Indo-Pacific interests at this point, that doesn't mean they couldn't be in the future. Uh, and so, um, you know, the issue of, of CENTCOM versus PAYCOM uh, um, is probably one of the bigger bigger issues. Uh, and, and my assumption is that the United States' reference um, to its Indo-Pacific backyard is from Hollywood to Bollywood is um, probably to keep people in Florida happy at CENTCOM uh, and, and, and not expanding their bailiwick. Again, this doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, CENTCOM comes right to the border of, of, of India with, with Pakistan, and then India is part of PACOM. It, it's, it's just a bureaucratic thing. Um, this this uh, uh, comments about reactions, um, I think the Indo-Pacific Partnership, whatever it may be, is certainly reactive at this point. Um, and... Uh, I don't know that it, it, it will necessarily, I don't know when it will be proactive, if, if, if ever. Um, uh, the international system in general, uh, and we can go back um, uh, a few centuries at least, as far as this is concerned, uh, does not like, um, certainly doesn't like chaos, uh, is... Um, wary of change of any sort. And so any time you get a rapidly um, rising, emerging power, uh, and China certainly fits the bill here, um, but India does as well, interestingly. Uh, um, it injects a lot of uncertainty in, into this. Um, and, you know, I, I can illustrate this by, you know, I mentioned earlier this uh, self-declared independent Republic of Somaliland, which I've, I've spent a lot of time um, over the past five years. And look, it's, it's been de facto independent for 25 years. It's fully functioning. It prints its own money. I get a, a Somaliland visas in my passport, et cetera, et cetera. It wants nothing to do with Mogadishu anymore. And yet the international community has no interest, no overriding interest in endorsing a change and redrawing maps is basically what it amounts to. Um, and so I would say that that's, that's part of the issue is that um, I think the, 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 the director's points were very well taken in that India is, is largely a status quo power. It likes incremental change. And we're seeing uh, potentially see a sea change um, with, with, with the rise of China and, and its um, emphasis on not so much refashioning institutions but, but recreating them, okay, um, whether anybody's going to use them or not is, is in question. So um, I think I think that might have that'll be my answer. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Wonderful discussion. In fact, uh, let me first comment on that um, status quo versus revisionist power. I completely agree. In fact, um, I don't want to enter into that debate by saying that India has already emerged as a revisionist power, or China, for that uh, context, has em already emerged as a revisionist power. The the point I was trying to make is that emerging powers also hold revisionist tendencies, and they, they were trying to reform the institutions, and I think I didn't uh, say it properly. And in fact, uh, I have written in three to four, uh, four months back a piece in PACnet uh, in the Honolulu, Hawaii-based Honolulu, that uh, Pacific Forum, PACnet, uh, there is a commentary. 
and the commentary titles that uh, does India really view China as a revisionist power? Uh, we don't. We don't view China as a revisionist power. I mean, of course, officially we haven't seen China. We haven't called China as a revisionist power. Primarily, primarily, because we do find our interest associated with China in terms of revising the global rules and regulations, particularly in the Britain Road institutions. And uh, since uh, last one and a half decades, we are trying to do this. Um, I'll end at that. Uh, second is that uh, again coming back to that um, questions, uh, both Sanjay's questions and again. The questions from that side is, um, is it really merely countering China? Let me combine both the questions. I mean, if India do not rise, yes, I mean, India is rising. And that's why we are today talking about Indo-Pacific. And the concept has become prominent because of India, primarily, because there is an Indianness attached to that. And uh, the Chinese partly do not subscribe to this concept because they do not uh, want to hold, uh, you know, any prominence to India or Indianness uh, to the to the concept. Uh, of course, the Chinese reservation is much uh, bigger. There are other uh, issues attached to it. But let me um, comment a few things about uh, where do we stand when it comes to China in Indo-Pacific? And that will explain the answer to your questions and the other questions. Uh, let me classify three periods uh, in last two decades. One is the period from 2001, 2002 onwards till 2006-07. Then from 2006-07 onwards to 2013-14, and from 2013-14 onwards till today or maybe in coming times. Now, 2002-2003 was the period when the world started talking about the rise of China, and they started talking about the you know, uh, rise of China becoming a threat. In fact, uh, the Americans, they propounded that China threat theory. The Chinese responded by saying that our rise is peaceful. Chung Chung Pichian's famous concept goes there, peaceful rise of China. And in fact, they revised further by saying it's a peaceful development framework. It's a peaceful development of China. If you see that debate, China threat theory plus China, peaceful rise of China theory, we didn't really respond to that debate. In fact, we did not fall to the American uh, threat uh, phenomenon theory. We responded to the Ch rise of China positively, as I mentioned earlier, that Prime Minister Bajpayee's visit to China in 2000 said the, you know, discourse further. Uh, we started seeing China as an economic partner in further years from there on. And we saw that our relationship with China was actually went and becoming much more strong and stronger. 2007-8 is the period when the second period in India-China relation in 21st century started where actually we started the BRICS and we started also the basic framework, the climate change network. That was a big initiative because uh, there we tried to identify our interest with the Chinese when it comes to the global phenomenon. So we, we have never all this year actually seen China the way West has seen China. We haven't seen China as a threat the way West has seen. For West, the China threat theory is based on China replacing the West. For us, we have never seen that China is going to replace us. We know that for a fact that the Chinese are affecting our interest in the region, but they have not really uh, arrived in a position where they replace India as a power. India as a power is much more stronger, uh, much more accepted uh, among the neighbors, and the Chinese are not really going to replace that in any time soon. Uh, the third point is 2013-14 period when the Chinese introduced this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Of course, Belt and Road Initiative, many would say that it's Xi Jinping's idea, a flagship <laughs> initiative. It's one way of saying that. Actually, it's not a new concept. It's, it's an old concept which is evolving for some, some time. So, actually, the previous president of Hu Jintao introduced the Go, Go West diplomacy or Go Out diplomacy. Uh, under that framework, China actually emerged as a trading nation gradually. So today, what we are saying under the Itha Ilu, One Belt, One Road initiative, most of these issues are uh, being covered by the Chinese for the last two decades or so. So again, I would uh, come back by saying that um, Indo-Pacific might have arrived or might have triggered uh, with the rise of China, but the attempt is not to counter China. Probably the attempt from India's point of view, the way we see, is to balance Chinese outreach and make China to become more accountable uh, to the regional and international situation uh, and the decision-making process. The attempt from India's point of view is not to counter China. We have not really followed the U.S. trap. U.S. theory. And in fact, if you see the fundamental difference between India and U.S. is that U.S. has always followed that containment strategy of China. And today Trump actually brings, you know, uh, a new element to that containment strategy by derailing the Chinese economic growth. 
by you know imposing sanctions and all so the us strategy we haven't really su subscribed to that so our strategy our plan is not to counter china but to balance chinese outreach to some extent thank you i'm tempted now to say a few things myself just tempted starting with though this thing what is it reactive or pro become proactive i think the point was raised I feel historically and I, therefore i always tell my friends to study ir please study history because without study of history it's very very difficult to put things in context look at the cold war how did the cold war start after the second world war things should have been hunky dory but once soviet union flex itself in east europe hungary and czech republic if you remember how masaryk and the death was how austria was about to fall to the communist and now the communist in uh, italy and france were flexing themselves that the americans were reminded that you can't just go away you have to come back you know if you want peace and stability you'll have to come back or the north korean the war of the korean peninsula the crossing of the yalu river so in most such cases i'm not saying who's right who's wrong that's not my point in all such cases with there is a change in the status quo a rising power challenging the status quo status quo is unjust there's no two opinion about it but if somebody is rising to challenge the status quo others would feel uncomfortable by it so in that sense it is necessarily pro reactive it's very difficult to the proactive person is a divisionist up back to cortelia they are the proactive guys others necessarily want to contain it you may call it balance it you may call it contain it you want to contain the changes within the framework as best as possible it's only when that paradigm doesn't work at all that you dump that paradigm for another paradigm but you want to do it as a last resort you won't want to begin by changing the paradigm because you don't know what the alternative would be and how would you be better off under a new hegemon who's next to you or a hegemon who's 12000 miles away it is something that you reality that you face i mean and this was tightly disagree with jagannath i tell my friends in usa china is my neighbor we have a border problem according to us the chinese are an occupation of our territory according to us china has given nuclear missile technology to pakistan and therefore i have to live with china on a daily basis whether i like it or not i do not want to enter into a conflict so therefore we emphasize on trade and therefore the vajpayee 2003 visit must also be seen with the vajpayee may 12th letter to clinton may 12th 1998 letter to clinton you see both one has a certain role the other set role so we don't want to prolong the conflict you want to solve the conflict and therefore we pushed for the resolution of the border dispute the chinese are in no mood because of the historical problem leave it to the future so you know this is the kind of problem that you will continue to face and therefore as i said don't go picking fights but don't sit back and expect nothing will happen you know if because if a neighborhood does change and i remember uh, the famous book uh, kaplan's book monsoon talk about gwadhar port says gwadhar is run by the port of singapore authority psa which is fine for the indians the pakistanis would never hand over gwadhar to the chinese company to run it that will be crossing red border li right red lines excuse me did it happen no that is happy to cut over and we just sat back you know so the fact is that if you are not alert enough at different moments of time and you hope things will work out you may be lucky but on the other hand you may not be lucky so how then does a country cope with this is something that we in this neighborhood would really have to learn to live with uncertainty for times to come and which is why the whole discussion of quad why is quad going somewhere but not going anywhere the moment the chinese increase the temperature the quad becomes important the moment then chinese put on a charm offensive india and australia start saying okay okay quad japan even says quad can wait you know so this is a kind of ongoing pulls and pressures which we are going to live with so i thought that was some that so i'll just can i say Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. You know, the three willing discussion. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just uh, will take it from the court. You know, in 2007, when we had the first court meeting, yeah. you know, it was the Australians. You know, <laughs> was one of the five. Yeah. They first uh, chickened out, right? Yeah. And then, then it was you. Uh, then it was Japan, and then you know, we were left high and dry. You know, we were given Dimash. 
right uh, then foreign secretary shiv shankar menon you know he had to face, you know i remember you know i was uh, still a young journalist you know i believe the chinese sort of reacted little um, uh, fast to this indo pacific and whether there was no concept in i think they reacted they should have you know judged and analyzed i think they reacted little more and trying to do this charm offensive you know break you know trying to sort of you know uh, after uh, the last party congress uh, uh, they felt that you know this squad you know in in my little understanding of china you know, of course they they find it very easy to deal bilaterally with most of them because in power equation they are far ahead with most of the countries except the us right so they love to deal with the moment there is a formation there is a sort of a you know a grouping they, that when they start getting jittery and that that's what today you know japan is willing to join a belt and road initiative in non sensitive sectors in western africa because the japanese companies are, 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 are trying to benefit out of it right because the japanese government can't stop the japanese companies benefiting out of it right today singapore is willing to put some funds into it because singapore had seen what happen to their businessmen in china you know they they are in a neighborhood you know they have to you know their model is a western model they have their their uh, you know their officials make it a point that they they are trying to balance but at the end of the day you know they have to do a trade a very very fine uh, you know path i think the quad is not you know a containment policy it's more to be change the chinese behavior i think the entire exercise is to change the chinese behavior and to bring it you know uh, you know as 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 you had the brendan had mentioned you know the the initial idea was that you know china will become like us that was the us and uh, you know that was i think the us thinking but 20 years i think president clinton gave china a long rope you know a very long rope for 8 years and president bush you know while he was probably the best american president that we could have hoped for you know it was focused too much in iraq in a war which i don't know which would serve whose purpose actually was was again yeah, giving a long rope to the chinese you know 8 and 8 16 years you know and who is not going to and given the way the chinese functions of course the chinese benefited out of now we have trying to you know you know we china didn't become a us and china will not be you know the ussr was involved in a much more you know uh, I, i guess in in a, in a in a system that you know which was still you know they were talking to each other they they were following the international rules norms you you had assault and you had a start you know now of course is a different ball game altogether under putin but this country wants to be you know and you have uh, the the us now i guess is wary of the technological leap that china is making and some and and, and the chinese definitely want to close this gap and the, the next frontier i guess you know it through uh, whether it's in new pacific and other concepts is is you know how the us probably have wants to maintain this gap and how the europe wants to maintain this gap right the chinese are caught catching up fast right and we actually i mean in india if you see that we are not in that rules making of of these 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 things and where are we like i, I don't have an answer where are we in this with this yeah please we of course don't even articulate our position right good afternoon uh, my name is abhiran sadat i work here as a senior researcher so by now we have established that the quad was either a reaction or a containment strategy for uh, with respect to china my question is is there any prospects of quad addressing non secure non traditional security issues in the future by non uh, traditional security threats i mean environmental disasters terrorism migration or cyber threats yeah disaster management is part of that yeah know. yeah disaster it's management counter terrorism is part it's it's already a part of uh, the quad framework in fact if you see the press releases of the four countries in increasingly referring to non traditional addressing non traditional security not in you know in such and such words but yes and in fact uh, when uh, in 2007 the idea came up 2006 7 it it came up for that particular reason only to address the non traditional security issues in the region i just want to add to that the foip strategy of japan uh, for instance talks about climate change but uh, us does not subscribe to the idea of climate change at all uh, when uh, looking at indo pacific then for instance germany uh, uh, wants uh, the intervention of international organizations which the others are not comfortable with and then america there's another difference they say that state craft should be given primacy uh, rather than uh, all these uh, multilateral uh, initiatives basically that yeah, yeah, just one sentence only because you must talk about the non traditional security framework to not give china an excuse to say you guys are containing me and that is why 
we'll always talk about the non-traditional security threats far more than why we're actually meeting. Gentlemen. Well, thank you very much indeed. What a fascinating subject and a fascinating attraction, especially from young minds who have really been addressing these questions from the contemporary situation. But taking on from the director's initial statement, that one has to look at this also from a historic perspective. The necessity for redefining the security architecture is because of the changing strategic situations in Asia-Pacific or in Asia at large, including, of course, now even more, the regions West Asia and others, greater conflict-related developments necessitating a response from the rest of Asia to those developments as well. I have been involved in the late 1980s as with the rise of India as a significant power in Asia, it was necessary to include a India also in the Asia-Pacific structure. And that is when we seriously began our engagement, strategic engagement with the USA. Large number of meetings with the SYNC back then, not the PACOM, SYNC back then, powerful organization, largest by far military command of the US, etc., etc., when we began an engagement to sink back in the late 1980s, a thing that struck us immediately was that the sink back boundary lay between Pakistan and India. And where our strategic concerns, security concerns, were quite significantly related to Pakistan and to the West, the sink back had no role to play. And the CENTCOM those days, as you know, was uh, hardly a significant establishment command as far as the US forces went. No responsibility at all. Uh, it's only in the 1999 when the American embassies were struck and General Zinni, then the CENTCOM commander, had to go to Pakistan to hold the Pakistani chief's hands, almost literally, because he was decided to strike uh, Afghanistan by the missiles. And of course, the Pakistani generals would think that the missiles are flying over the territory from India. 1988. Uh, uh, so, therefore, the realization came that this region had to be taken together. The entire Southeast Asian organizational development, the ASEAN expansion, CSCAP process, once again we tend to underrate that, very significant process, the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia-Pacific, where India was a very significant player at that time, but after a while. And to the current time that we see, it is in a situ situation where Russia is a much less significant player now in all of Asia. And it is China. And the emergence of China that has compelled the rest of the region to take a fresh look at what China is all about. And we are in the process of finding out as well. The 1972 China-US accord, uh, understanding, excellent visit, etc., changed the situation entirely. And precisely, as the director had mentioned, China was expected to be just as it became a middle income power, it was about to become a liberal state. Liberal state just like Japan, South Korea and others were becoming. Well, that did not turn out to be the reality. And it is in trying to deal with that situation that we are looking for ways how to structure ourselves. In that context, well, you know, I must uh, admit and express this very straightforward uh, uh, directly, the Prime Minister Modi's Shangri-La st uh, statement has been the most significant statement on all issues related to Indo-Pacific Asia, Pacific security. It spells out in the broadest term, also in the clearest terms, the way that this issue needs to be addressed. Along with this, Quad. Quad is a very ephemeral organization. Today it is this, tomorrow it is that, the after tomorrow it will probably not even exist. But how we structure relations among ourselves and the defining of the Indo-Pacific has been a significant contribution to include the whole region and enable India a significant role in the framing of policies in security in the Indo-Pacific region. Perhaps I think we need to address this issue from that perspective and identify also for ourselves as to what specific roles 
responsibilities that we will need to follow. How did he deal with China? How did he deal with the U.S.? Are they treating U.S.? How about ASEAN? Even though we talk about its centrality, we are aware of the reality that ASEAN is splitting. ASEAN, ASEAN as a regional organization are losing, is losing its credibility. So all these changing situations may be a challenge for India. How do we deal with these challenges? Thank you. It's up till 12.30. We have 20 minutes to go. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, maybe it's a little deviating, but I want to ask in terms of India-China relations and uh, India-China policy in recent years, that what do you think of the India-Tibet policy uh, in terms of India-China relations and settling the border disputes with China? Because India is also looking to, you know, change or evolve India-Tibet policy in, in recent times. So that is the question. Huh? Okay. I mean, it's a slightly different question uh, from what we are discussing today here. But let me just uh, briefly say that I think, uh, I don't know from where this uh, debate really comes from, but we always had a defined Tibet policy. And, um, and there should not be any qualm about that. There should not be any doubt about that. I think it's a clear-cut stated policy since a long time we have maintained, particularly when uh, again, Atal Bihar Bajpay went uh, to China to build the, rebuild the relationship and bring normalization. Since that time, we have taken a stated policy that Tibet is an autonomous and integral part of China. So, given that, I think there are issues what we are really talking about. Now, when we are talking about Tibet policy, we are confusing with the issues linked with the Tibet issue. And there are greater issues. For example, the issue of Dalai Lama. The Chinese for a long time, I mean, of course, not officially probably, but uh, they have been expressing their uh, reservation about Dalai Lama's activities, operations, the way Dalai Lama has been giving statement uh, over the last 20 years or uh, 30 years. So I think that issue has triggered in many public speculations that we don't have a Tibet policy. There are other issues of uh, 120,000 Tibetans or a little more maybe if we try to uh, bring together the India and the uh, Nepal uh, plateau together. The 120,000 uh, plus uh, Tibetans who are living, we have done what we could be doing maximum. In fact, uh, if we try to see it skeptically, we haven't done the same probably for our uh, people who are staying uh, in Kumayan region or in the Dharmasala region. But uh, I think there are always a greater expectation from India because uh, the globalization process, the India-China relation, the rise of India, as Sanjay was talking, from there the expectations have again emerged that India should be taking a greater care of the Tibetan communities. And that has in a way uh, brought out the, uh, the debate to the core that uh, whether India is having a Tibet policy or not. Uh, beyond these two issues about the Dalai Lama and um, the Tibetan community, I think the other debate which uh, actually try to time and day again resurface <coughs> India's Tibet policy is that uh, if you try to understand that most of the countries have actually withdrawn from taking a position or a ex extending a direct support to the Tibetan courts, which India has not really done that. India has been quite consistent in our position. Um, we have been quite categorical when it co uh, come to the cause of the debate. We have not really compromised on that. But what we have done in the process is that uh, we have improved our relationship with China. We have not really neglected that, despite of our problems on the boundary issues, on, on other issues. And that has, you know, tried to um, resurface the debate whether India is really compromising on its approach toward the Tibetan communities on the Tibet issue and all. So I don't really see that this debate is, should be, I mean, we should be really talking about about whether India is having a Tibet policy. I think that's a pretty defined, clear-cut Tibet policy. In fact, if you try to understand India is having the best possible defined China strategy in the world, and that's a separate debate. I'm not really addressing that, but uh, just to answer your questions, uh, that we do have a defined Tibet policy. I, I don't have anything to add to Jagannath's answer on Tibet. Um, but I, I do want to uh, address some of the comments made by the 
the, the gentleman across the room, um, which are very good. Uh, so I think what we're seeing is that there's there's not a real issue with China attempting to uh, refashion, reshape, or create new um, financial institutions, for for example. Um, uh, you know, reform of Bretton Woods, reform of the IMF, reform of uh, uh, many of these organizations is something that uh, New Delhi's wanted for a long time, Beijing wanted. Um, uh, certainly uh, countries like Turkey have been very vocal about this. Um, but if you take the example of Turkey, look, the problem with, with, with a country um, like Turkey and the United States getting along right now is not about President Erdogan talking about reform of the IMF. The problem is buying missiles from a power like Russia and what it means for NATO. Okay, so it's these kind of geostrategic, geopolitical red lines that get crossed where an issue becomes, uh, to use the term again, securitized uh, for, for, for Washington in this case. I think with the Indo-Pacific, um, Tokyo has, has been very concerned about the omnipresent threat that a uh, a very powerful uh, political and military China um, poses to it. And uh, India understands its issues with borders, obviously, very well, et cetera, but it's been slower to recognize this. I think that's, that's, that's changing and changing rapidly, um, particularly when you look at China's actions next door in Pakistan as much as Doklam, et cetera. Um, I think Washington is also starting to understand this. Remember, as the director said, I mean, Washington is, you know, 5,000 miles away. It's, 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 um, China's not an omnipresent threat to it as it is for, for a country like, uh, like Japan, most certainly. So um, these, will be the, this, these will be where you see the developments happen, um, should they happen vis-a-vis -vis an Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, I'm certainly hoping we won't see... Uh, as a student of history, another um, Sudetenland or something like that. That I don't. I don't think it needs to go that route, right? Uh, and and but but that isn't just hyperbole either. Um, the very recent interesting developments. You read about them last week. Uh, developments at Hamban Tota with companies, Indian companies, etc. Uh, now doing some business there. Um, but as interesting uh, would be the uh, news out of Dukam in Oman. Uh, the Chinese built port there, um, where U.S. companies are now involved. And that, to me, it, um, speaks volumes, perhaps, uh, because Washington's been, again, uh, well, I don't need to tell you about the dysfunction in Washington over the past few years. So it seems that maybe something may be changing, or it's changed in a certain quarter in Washington, let's put it that way. I guess, you know, just with Washington has a, in the last eight months, has a more cohesive, concrete policy on how to deal with China finally. Yes. Right, you know, be it in terms of countering technology on, on, on economy. And, and I'm told there's a bipartisan support to this, even if there is a change of card and, and this is going to continue, you know. Uh, maybe they need to put, you know, they announced $170 million, which is peanuts, and then the Build Act. And uh, they've announced, you know, last week, India and U.S. signed a pact for third country cooperation in uh, Southeast Asia, I'm told, and, and Africa. But the amount is, is too less if you just look at, you know, because the projects are different. Projects are less sensitive, you know, more capacity building, say hospitals and others, which we have done in, in Afghanistan, may, may now look at, uh, in Myanmar and elsewhere. Uh, but, and I understand that U.S. Congress needs to approve the amount, actually, for, you know, your which now the State Department has to convince the U.S. Congress and the U.S. Congress has to, and maybe they'll release 10, billion, 10 million, not even 10 billion. So, so I think we, maybe in terms of alternatives, there need to be some projects which then can be showcased. You know, this is a project, you know, I think today uh, if, if the Sabang in, in Indonesia, you know, if we are involved, and I believe the Indonesians are also in, keen that India come for another two ports, you know, and including them. So those are becoming more symbolic, you know, or, 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 uh, or uh, Chabahar is becoming more symbolic, you know, in terms of, although they were not planned initially to, at least Chabahar was not when BRI concept didn't exist, but, you know, could, could be, maybe, maybe some projects to showcase, then that would be, that would be an alternative that could be offered to the other countries. Well, you know. 
they can balance China. So, or Chinese could change the behavior following that. This, this is a very good point. Maybe just that, um, add something to that. So the, the developments between um, Indian and uh, potential Indian and, and, and American development projects, for example, in Southeast Asia are um, – they're welcome on the one hand, and they're concerning to me for another for another reason. Uh, and having lived for many years in, in in Eastern Africa and seen the the detriment of development aid and capacity building, all this stuff. I mean, you, if you've been to Afghanistan, you you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the, my my hope would be that perhaps as a, if and when a security element is injected into these development projects that they might actually develop into something. And that is, that is, um, I, th I think that will need to happen before countries such as India, India and the United States and India and Japan really begin to cooperate on major infrastructure development projects. At the time it is, so this is no news to any of you, at the time it is all China all the time. And individually, Neither the United States nor India nor Japan, et cetera, can compete against um, uh, China as far as uh, scale. They don't have the rationale to do so either. And so um, I don't think that this is a necessity that the Indian in the United States and Japan have to work together on development projects. Um, I don't think it would be a bad thing if they did as long as it's done in, in, in um, what we could term an appropriate manner. And, and I think the only way for that to be done is if there's a security element um, involved in it. So. Thank you. Uh, I mean, we had very good discussions today. I mean, lively discussions, exchange of views. And one of the things that we often talk about is of power shifts. And one of the things that came up in uh, the director's comments when he talked about how Indian policymakers about a decade and a half ago looked at power shift and the way they were looking at and trying to project how the world will evolve and it appears that many of their observations have come true. So when we are thinking of power shift, what it, it, it comes to my mind is that uh, the power shift when it was in its infancy, that's when uh, some of the leaders that the director mentioned were trying to make sense of that power shift and the way they projected uh, how the world will evolve. And the kind of criticism that they were subjected to tells a lot about how we look at the world in this country. That's an important uh, dimension that came through uh, his remarks. Uh, and the other dimension is uh, continuing that conversation on power shift is how, what Brendan pointed out, uh, the four major countries, he, I mean, he referred to them as four big shifts that are navigating and taking a turn uh, in their foreign policies. And uh, these, uh, uh, the turn of these four big ships is going to be impacted by various other factors such as domestic political compulsions, populist policies, and uh, concerns about securitization. And his, one of his most important points that for me was that while we focus on big states, he was saying don't forget the small states, the medium powers. They also have a capacity to impact how the structure called Indo-Pacific will evolve. Uh, that's an uh, interesting observation there. And of course, <clears throat> Jagannath pointed about, uh, uh, referred to about the four I's, I mean, ideas, interests, infrastructure, uh, uh, and the other issues that are impacting the emergence of Indo-Pacific, and we had in some interesting dialogue on whether the Indo-Pacific is a consequence of rise of China or whether it is rise of India, and uh, subsequently we had some uh, good discussions, which I'll come to in a minute. And of course, Shreya talked about how European Union uh, I mean, when she was talking about European, she had two tracks. One is the European Union as an entity and how it is engaging with the idea of Indo-Pacific. And there she felt that not much thinking is going on. Uh, while there are some references, uh, uh, there can be a possibility of greater reflection on that. And the second track that she took is uh, examining the policies of individual countries, whether it is France, Britain, Germany, and pointed out that while France seems to have a concept and a strategy in place, UK has more capabilities. 
uh, and the disjunction and the necessity of bringing those two together uh, in some form on Indo-Pacific is something that she was alluding to. And of course, Dipanjan's presentation, as I mean, he's fresh from the field. He visited the Southeast Asia recently. Uh, I think he uh, fleshed out uh, four or five important uh, challenges that confront the emergence of Indo-Pacific, or how Indo-Pacific will evolve by confronting these challenges. Uh, one is the perception of the U.S. neglect, even if it is interested now, the possible neglect. To use uh, an academic terminology, the fear about abandonment by an ally uh, is, a, uh, is one of the concerns that seems to be seeping through uh, Southeast Asia, especially allies such as United uh, Thailand, for instance. Uh, and then uh, the uh, dichotomy of political engagement versus economic engagement, where China is a significant uh, uh, trade partner, diasporic presence. So how do you deal with Indo-Pacific in a manner that did not uh, rise up tensions with China? And concerns, of course, about ASEAN centrality is something that uh, uh, he alluded to. And, uh, uh, and his contention was how do these all these various frameworks and structures come into play together, whether it is Quad, trilaterals, and ASEAN-related things, how can they be collaged into an integrated structure to manage Indo-Pacific? Those are some of the important points that he was referring to in his discussion. In the question-answer sessions, one of the things that came out was uh, an offshoot of the discussion on Indo-Pacific is what is rise of China and how did countries respond to it? And uh, uh, Jagannath was like, United States and others followed a st solid containment strategy. India did not. And others such as uh, Dipanjan contested that and pointed out, on the contrary, uh, the United States and others facilitated uh, the emergence of uh, China. If not facilitated, it's only now with the advent of Trump there is a more consolidated approach on looking at China. Uh, and... Uh, of course, the director mentioned about the fact that we are located right next to China and having a boundary dispute. Uh, there is both a, a, a desire to respond, see China, if not as a threat, as a significant challenge to deal with. Uh, in that sense, uh, I think we have covered most of the important areas on Indo-Pacific. Uh, and uh, it was genuinely very useful, and I thank all the presenters uh, and the director of the institution, Sri Shakti Sinha, for facilitating the dialogue, and of course all the participants here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Let's move for lunch. Let's